Um, I'm uh, presenting uh, small takes on big places and um, I've written a small artist statement here. Um, often I'm photographing trees and I'm outdoors in nature. I think that that's the thing I am most often doing, but I've really found it's very calm to go through buildings. Some are beautiful, some are older. Um, and I know I'm just photographing the work of, if you will, other architects, you know, many of whom are geniuses. Um, but, you know, it's nice to try to find compositions. It's a great photographic exercise and experience to find something that has, for me, some feelings, uh, whatever they may be. And so... Um, what I've been photographing uh, is places I'm in, like, you know, large art museums, uh, industrial buildings, uh, places that might be a campus at a university or, or nearby one. So I, uh, I've been doing, you know, fine art photography for about 15 years. Um, I photograph quite a bit before then, but mostly photographs of my kids <laughs> and travel. Um, but I've had I've had work exhibited uh, in quite a few shows. Um, about 80 shows uh, in about 30 or more than 30 different uh, venues. And I've had a couple uh, of uh, pieces published. So let me move on to uh, the first place that uh, we're looking at is the Getty Center and Museum. So I've been out to Los Angeles quite often. Uh, the reason being that my brother-in-law uh, lives out there and so he lives in Glendale, which is sort of northern Los Angeles. And so I get the opportunity to go out uh, just for visits with my wife. We'll go go see him. And one of my favorite, favorite places uh, really anywhere is the Getty Museum for, for many reasons. Um, uh, it's got an interesting uh, architect who at the time was one of the youngest architects to win an architecture prize. And he had a very large uh, landscape area to put this together on, and he used kind of a grid, uh, you know, human scale size things, you know, 60 by 60 inches, 30 by 30 inches. Interesting to see the rectangles and the squares, particularly the square uh, effect everywhere. But he also has lots of curves that people are using, and he used... Um, Interestingly enough, marble that was a travertine that was quarried in the same place that they took it out for the Roman Colosseum and the Trevi Fountain many, many uh, centuries ago. So kind of cool stuff and great views. So um, just going to show you a few sort of pictures uh, of it. You know, these aren't my uh, small takes, but just to give you an idea of it, this is often called the grand piano uh, because it has that sort of grand piano look and it has these lots of the little squares everywhere that you would see. And then it is just a magnificent view. So just to go there for the view is something. Uh, you park your car down below, you take a tram up this very, uh, this, uh, this high elevation. And then you're really looking out over all of Los Angeles, which is just a delight. And you can see the Pacific Ocean in the distance, um, sometimes Catalina Island. Sometimes you can't see them if the smog is dense, but it's a wonderful place to be. It's, it's a little like the view from the Griffith Observatory, just a little farther to the west. And there's also some gorgeous gardens there that were designed by a landscape architect. So some of the buildings are the museum. Some of the buildings are administrative buildings where they're ma maintaining the administration of the Getty Foundation and other aspects of the site. So this is really the kind of thing that I'm uh, that I'm talking about tonight, uh, my small takes on big places. And surprisingly here, even with all of those wonderful squares that were the design, it's the curves that I found so interesting for the most part, that things were wonderfully curved here. And um, I've chosen to do all of my images in color. Uh, quite frequently, architectural details are done as black and white because of the, you know, you have the the lines, you have the texture, and so on. But I really like the color of the places I was photographing, and when I put them in black and white to take a look, I really was missing the color. So I worked on maintaining the color, you know, realistically, but enhancing just a little to make it, you know, have have the tones that I was seeing while I was present. And often I'm trying to find locations in the buildings that like this one, which are kind of underneath from away from the galleries. This is just an area that you're walking through to get to a stairway or an elevator. 
but I just loved all the triangles and the shapes um, and the way the light was coming through, giving it a really wonderful space. I also love looking up at things uh, and particularly when on a day like I was uh, there for these photographs, it was a blue sky day and it often is in Los Angeles. And I really love uh, the blue peeking through. I love the way the light was falling at that particular time. It was afternoon light and just getting great, nice shadows, um, interesting barred patterns. I really like the the curves and the shapes. And then I was surprised to find as I read more, that the design was built off the squares because I, they're more on the outside than in some of these locations indoors. And then in this location, when I looked up, I thought I was underneath an LA freeway. And I still don't know and haven't found out whether or not the architect was thinking about freeways when he uh, did the design. But looking up, um, it was just sort of the mixture of the colors, uh, the interesting glass that has sort of a greenish tone, but depending on what it's reflecting, takes on sort of some blue tones. And really just liked the, the shape and the curves. And one of the elements I'm really working at in my architectural detail images is trying to get some sense of depth in my image. So I'm trying to get a sense of a foreground, a middle ground, and a background, and then uh, trying to you know, use the light that's there. Often it does uh, accentuate and provide that, that, that. and if not, I'll, I'll uh, accentuate it a little more in order to try to get the, the depth in the image. And then I don't do a lot of minimalism, but um, if you look in the upper right corner here, and I'll just magnify that for you for a minute, there are these sort of light fixtures. And I took some of them out here, uh, I'll confess, using Photoshop uh, to remove you know, an unwanted uh, bit here and there. But it's sort of like, oh, this shape could be anywhere or anything. Uh, there's no scale. Uh, you don't know what you're looking at. It could be... Um, it could be almost anything really. And so I kind of like, I like the fact that often you lose the scale in buildings. I certainly have photographs where there's an enormous building or a huge cliff or, and you see the tiny little person to gives you the scale of how large it is. But there's something fun about not knowing how big this is. And you can, in your imagination, uh, take a look and decide what it could be. And I just happen to like the particular shape of that curve. And in this particular image, I'm inside uh, the Getty Museum looking out. And while I was looking out, I noticed that um, there were these really interesting reflections that, you know, to me felt a little like, is this like the ghost of Getty or something that's in there? Because it was quite interesting to see because you can see the, you know, the, the railings that are there, you know, the wonderful design, the crisp of everything you can see uh you know with the light coming through from the sky on the right you can see the separation between the blocks at such regular intervals you can see how rough the travertine uh, cut of the marble is on the left and people have reported although i did not see any that you can actually find a fossil right in the right in the stone itself as you're walking around you'll suddenly see wait a second that looks like a little fish skeleton and actually it is a little fish skeleton because it's been preserved in this marble that's compressed down after many hundreds of millions of years so um just really really enjoy being there and getting these kind of looks instead of the just the normal like look at the beautiful grounds and buildings so most of the images you're seeing tonight will be images like these that are of small spaces so now we're going to go from the West Coast and fly all the way back to Pittsburgh. And out near Pittsburgh, there's an historic blast furnace called the Cary Furnace. Um, it fell into disrepair for uh, quite a few years um, uh, from the 1980s into the 2000s. And then it's begun to be uh, renovated a little bit. Some artists have reused it uh, for spaces. Um, it's even been used uh, for film backdrops. I was surprised to find that there were things such as episodes of the Antique Roadshow, uh, places like American Ninja Warrior, which I don't know if I've ever seen, and some Christian Bale things, who's a fabulous director. So they found this space that's one of the few uh, blast furnaces that were used to create the type of metal used in battleships during World War II and before World War II, because it, be, it began operating. A, this is an Andrew Carnegie uh, steel uh, factory, 
and it was a total steel town. So it's an interesting town around it as well. There's still remnants of what was everyone who lived there, pretty much everyone worked for uh, the steel mill. So from a long distance out, this is sort of what it looks like. Uh, it, you can see it's kind of uh, abandoned looking. You see, you know, things don't look 100% in repair. There's some graffiti. Um, as far as the size of things, this building here is probably about maybe 200 feet long or so, uh, as is this huge tower is maybe 200 feet high. So you get a sense of how um, how large this entire space is. It's a very, uh, a very uh, many acre area. And then this is where these enormous uh, furnaces were used to make sheets of steel that were very large for things like the battleship. So when I went uh, inside, I'm sort of going in close, uh, looking for these small takes on this incredibly large place. And so one of the things I found that I liked, I do photograph uh, abandoned, although not quite as often am I in an abandoned space as I once was. Uh, but when I'm in a place like this, you know, there's certainly the rust factor, you know, uh, there's the peeling, peelingness factor of those things. And I was, you know, also discovering that, you know, whatever the paint was that was used, or maybe just over time, and, and these are areas within the steel mill where it was generally protected from the elements. There might be a little bit of water on the floor here and there where the uh, the ceiling, you know, the ceilings had given out over time, but it wasn't like sitting out completely in the elements, but really interesting patina that is developed, you know, not only the strong texture, but also the color that sometimes is a little bits of blues or yellows or pinks or, or oranges that end up in there. And again, I like you know, the fact that you don't really know the scale. Like you might look at these nuts and, and think like, oh, I wonder how big these things are. They look kind of hefty. And in fact, uh, to put your arms around this round piece on the side, you'd have to reach your arms out as if you were wrapping around a redwood tree or something because it's about six feet across. So these, these nuts are quite large. <laughs> However, you don't know that this could be a very small piece and these are just little quarter inch uh, nuts. And I kind of like that it plays with what you might think of uh, in terms of scale. And again, the challenge here in setting up with a tripod in dark conditions, this is probably about a 20 second exposure and what was originally mostly dark with just a little light filtering through. Um, it's just trying to come up with a nice composition, you know, something that uh, gives me gives you pleasure, you know, when you look at it and, uh, and has some some elements, you know, that you would see uh, elsewhere. Now, in this particular piece, this photograph was taken in that large building that was to the left uh, when I showed you the entire area of Cary Furnace. And when I saw it, it was very late afternoon. The light was coming in just before sunset and it was the light itself was golden and everything here had this kind of a goldish paint to it. It was as if I was in some mysterious uh, cave of gold, as if I'd fallen into, um, you know, some sort of a, you know, <laughs> some sort of a film. And what's interesting about it when I was looking to get a composition here was trying to get <clears throat> more of the depth you know, trying to get as much depth as I could, you know, you sort of can see, you know, there's round areas here, there's an area here at the back, you know, that's farther all the way back where there's some pieces back there. There's, a, you know, different layers. And in fact, this opening in the front is large enough that it's about five or six feet tall, you could stand in there and not have to bend very much, you know, so it was really big. And I like that you don't know, because it could be the inside of a clock, or a watch and you just wouldn't know necessarily but i loved the color i loved all the circles i loved the roughness you know the rough hewn look to everything so it's as if someone had gone into this rough piece of rock almost like a sculptor and then put in these incredibly detailed you know pieces that were used to hook up whatever machines were used to mill the steel here in this part of the building so it was really cool it was a great great opportunity also, uh, in photographing looking up, this is a looking up photograph. Uh, in the background uh, is a sky. Uh, basically, I think it was overcast a bit that day. Um, you may not know the scale. This is, again, one of those extremely large pipes, uh, I guess for steam, maybe. Uh, I'm not sure. 
could have been from molten steel. I'm not really, you know, I don't know enough about steel mills and I haven't learned enough. But again, I, I am fascinated by the repetition that's provided by things like nuts and bolts that go around to seal uh, these uh, large pipes as they connect uh, to one part to another. And the decay and the rust and the textures. And in this case, um, I have my camera very, very close to this, which is why it's out of focus at the top. And I really liked when I got this image back that it had that sort of, I feel like there's a lot of pressure being applied on the person who's looking at it. It has a certain feel for that for me. And, and I kind of liked that as I was looking up at it and uh, the out of focus part was something that I was glad that I got. Not everyone's taste, but uh, it was to mine. And this is another looking up image. Um, these are a couple of those very large towers that we saw uh, in the first uh, image. And uh, again, I like the fact that even with this massiveness, uh, and here I was trying to get the composition to focus on sort of these circles and curves, then there's this delicate little walkway that uh, people would walk on, I think, to go from one side to the other. Uh, it's not quite an I-beam, but it looks, you know, like you'd be looking down through that. I guess as a worker, you would get used to it. As an ordinary person, I would be a little nervous. And of course, being an abandoned space, uh, it was not proper to go up there and risk your life that you might fall through the rusted thing. So that was enjoyable to photograph Carrie Furness uh, to do that. So in the theme of uh, sort of steel factories, this is one that probably all of you have been to at one time or another. Uh, this is Bethlehem Steel up in Bethlehem. Um, and if you've been up there, you know that while it was a uh, active, you know, steel making plant for many, many, many years, uh, many decades, uh, it closed in the 90s, uh, the mid 90s, it no longer could uh, keep up economically. And so it was closed. And it's part of, just like out at Cary, part of a very large um, town and with other buildings. And right across the street from it, if you've ever been there, uh, now there's entertainment areas because it's become an entertainment area. They're trying to turn it into the steel stacks where you can go to get a meal or just hang out. And the old buildings, though, are still there. Um, some have been used uh, within the last like 25 years, but generally they're abandoned or closed. I, you know, I would say they're not abandoned where people are able to get access to them, but they're closed up and they're still magnificent and interesting in their brutalist sort of way. You know, uh, some of these uh, were, were built in the mid fifties as opposed to a hundred years ago. I was interested to discover, you know, I always like to do a little background on the places that I've been. Um, I never realized all the places the Bethlehem steel was used. So one of them was in the Empire State Building. Uh, I think some of you would probably recognize the famous photograph of the men having lunch on the I-beam uh, way up above. I believe it's the Empire State Building. And while it was a staged photo, it's still a magnificent photo because I can't imagine sitting that high up on anything like that <laughs> with the breezes blowing. But it, along with a lot of Washington, uh, you know, George Washington Bridge and other places in New York, it was also used uh, in building the Golden Gate Bridge, which is a magnificent structure out on the West Coast. So pretty cool. And it did its part of building battleships, et cetera, in the wars, just like the, uh, the Cary Furnace did. So when you uh, look at it, you'll see that the, the big furnaces, which are in the background, uh, are actually similar looking in a way to carry furnace because I think it's designs that work for the process of making large pieces of steel. And this is a really great steel town. And what makes this uh, this particular look uh, is really fun to do because you may recognize the area. There's a church up here. It's about probably about six blocks away, but it's up a steep hill. Uh, it takes a little something to climb up here. It's a cemetery. And there's a famous photograph by Walker Evans. He was one of the documentary photographs in the 19 photographers in the 1930s. And he made a very you know, famous in its own way uh, photograph from up here in the cemetery. So I always like to go up. I've tried to recreate the photo. His photo has um, the cross of uh, some of the cemetery headstones in the foreground. You've got 
these row houses where the people who worked in the mill lived. And then of course, in the back were the factories. And in that time, the factories are belching smoke into the air and it's a bit foul looking and it was a full industrial site. And a classic photo and fun to try to recreate. You can't quite recreate it because things have moved a little bit. Some things have changed slightly, but still you can line it up pretty closely uh, and have fun recreating it. This one's a little farther up the slope from that, but I thought it would give you an overview. And it's always a great story to talk about someone like Walker Evans. This is another look. Um, and uh, this is, I'm going to say the blue hour. So, you know, it's after sunset. Um, it is, this photograph was taken in uh, December, I think, uh, early December. Um, and on the left, you have the steel mill. So you can sort of see how it looks there. Um, they do light them up uh, for people to see. And on the right, not only is there an entertainment complex, but there is actually an ice skating rink and people are ice skating. Um, and I took a long exposure on tripod uh, while I was uh, there. Um, in this particular case, for those who think about things like, you know, lenses and equipment, this was taken with a 15 millimeter uh, fixed prime lens, uh, manual focus, uh, which is great to use on a tripod. And I really liked getting the, just getting a sense of the whole place. So it gives you an idea of what it looks like if you've never been there, you probably have. And then this area on the left is where you can stand and come up to and look out across this way towards some of those other steel buildings. So in fact, this view is taken from there, but of course, during the day. And I just really love the juxtaposition of these older buildings that were have that industrial look of a century ago. And they're close by what has become a, an area that has in the background here, you can see that's a modern apartment building. And so uh, this was uh, on a day with a kind of a misty, foggy, a bit going on, you know, just a little bit. Um, and so, you know, this was also late afternoon sunlight coming in. Uh, I love this, uh, you know, I love the Edward Hopper light, you know, because you get the shadows, you get the wonderful warmth of things, you get all kinds of stuff at, uh, near the end of the day. In this particular case, uh, compositionally, I was really struck by the rectangles of the, all of these little windows, the rectangles of the bricks, the rectangles of the windows in the background, there's some rectangles in the lower foreground, and then a little interesting roof. And I just liked all the squares and the rectangles that are in here and the play with them. And again, tried to get a sense of depth so it's not seen quite as a totally flat image plus the wonderful light so i i like this image and uh, that this was again a small take on a very big building um and then as you can see i do like the rivets uh this is another huge huge piece but you don't quite know what the size is um the color is pretty close to the way the color looked um the rust actually in bright sunlight has this sort of very bright orange i think i I toned it down a little bit because it looked a little too uh, orangey, but it does look very orange in the bright sunlight uh, when it catches the sun coming across there. And then plenty of it is in shadow because there's other features of the building that protected other parts of it. So you get the softer light. But I just like the curves. I like the curves and the uh, some of the diagonal lines here. And again, compositionally, it's the kind of thing that draws my eye and that I try to put a frame around. And these are areas, uh, and you'll see here, um, these are areas that are exposed uh, outside areas of the Bethlehem steel. I have not been inside uh, this one. I think it is possible to get in maybe now. I'm not sure. Uh, you have to have the right connections, perhaps, <laughs> which I, I did not have. Um, however, I, um, I did... Uh, I do like seeing how it looks outdoors because you get the opportunity as in this case to see shadows. So some days when I photograph there, there's been overcast skies and you don't get this. And other days when I photographed, it's been bright sun. So sometimes I like to show just the shadow. Uh, often it's interesting to see just shadows against things as I'm sure you all know, but um, it's sometimes nice to show what's making the shadow. So in this case, um, I really liked 
the rustiness, the texture of this particular piece of metal. You don't know, again, how large it is. It could be a tailpipe, but something else. You don't know where it is. And again, the, the exposure to uh, places like rain, wind, you know, in places where it's located outdoors, you get the interesting striping of both rust, paint, anything that's kind of worn down. And so you got some nice colors here. So I just particularly liked the shape of the uh, the shadow here and wanted to kind of come in close to get that particular look. Sorry, just a second here. Um, sometimes the colors are uh, can be blue um, instead of you know, they're not always oranges. <laughs> so it has to do with the paint or what else was done. Uh, this is, again, you don't know how big this is. It's actually probably, I think it was about two feet across, something along those lines. What I particularly liked here was the writing around the edges of it. So somebody, I'm thinking when they were installing it, I guess, or maybe it has something to do with its operation, but I'm thinking when they were installing it, bolting it on, somebody then, you know, wrote little notes about things, how big it was, how wide it was. I don't know what the markings mean, but I kind of like them. You know, I kind of thought that was an interesting touch that, you know, you can see the personality of someone who would have been up on the side of this enormous uh, steel beast uh, installing these things and perhaps reinstalling them or repairing them and then making little notes along the way. I like that sort of human touch. It's not just a piece of metal, you know, that you wouldn't normally see. Now, here's a, another a really good example of the striping, and it's kind of what caught my eye here most of all was the depth. Uh, when I was looking at this, I was just struck by how, you know, you can see things that are up close, and then there's pipes in the background, and then there's pipes farther back, and they all have different colors, different paint had been applied. The rust has ended up rusting differently on each one. In some cases, the uh, the nuts or the bolts are in pretty good condition. They look like you could probably put a wrench to them and undo them. And in other cases, it's quite decayed and it looks like it's getting close to where it might just, uh, you know, with a good push, you could, you know, topple something over. These are all, again, large things. Um, and the color was really, really interesting. Uh, I'm shooting on a tripod uh, here and probably it was about a, I'm thinking about a two second exposure or something. Um, uh, I don't think I used a filter on this uh, particular one. Sometimes I will shoot with a, a filter, you know, during daylight with a 10-stop filter or even a 15-stop filter, but I don't know that I did that here. I probably did a very low ISO, though, because I wanted to make sure I could get some of the darker parts in the back. And then in post-processing, what I've worked is I tried to expose for the highlights, expose to the right, as uh, some of you uh might do as well, so that I felt I could bring up some of the darkest areas uh, and do that successfully. Um, whereas if I blown the highlights, I was kind of out of luck. But I like the colors and the stripes here, and it gives you a sense of the overall effect that weather has on a huge steel furnace. So not too far from uh, Bethlehem is the kind of mid-sized town of Allentown. Um, and Allentown is kind of interesting. I've been up there several times. I mean, I've been there when I was younger, but I hadn't been until maybe the last, you know, four or five years, I've been up several times to go look around and kind of an interesting mix. It's got older buildings, newer buildings, some historic buildings. It makes for an interesting place. So here's a bit of a look of a section of Allentown. Um, it is, it's kind of a mid-sized city, I guess. I don't know how what the population is, but it's got about, you know, between 10 and 15 blocks of Main Street and maybe four blocks on each side or, you know, four blocks across. And that's kind of it. And the rest of it is mostly residential, but that area there is kind of this hodgepodge. So in the background here, I see a piece that reminds me of New York City. You know, it has the vertical lines, uh, the rectangles and the squares. It has the sort of tiered effect, making it all the way up to the top. I just think that's kind of interesting. And then in the foreground, there's another sort of a brownstone looking building that's kind of interesting looking. Uh, over here, there's a building uh, kind of the lower um, mid range, about halfway back. 
reminds me of school administration buildings. You know, it's got that kind of look of reminds me of, uh, I don't know, high schools, elementary schools that were built at a certain time. Uh, next to it is a large building that's kind of like an apartment building, you know, and it's fairly modern. They use some brick, but it's got, you know, the windows and the look of that. And yet in front of it is an older building that still has some writing on the side of it. You can just make out an old sign that had once been there. So this is kind of Allentown. Living in Allentown is this mix of sort of old and new. And uh, while I don't do a lot of reflection photos, um, I was looking at this uh, reflection uh, in a building that um, I was just kind of struck by it. So you, if you photograph reflections, it's a little like reflections or like when water's moving on a lake and you're, you know, you're trying to get some abstracts of the, you know, the wonderful water and it's reflecting boats in a harbor or something. So here, if you, you know, I was, as you've all done, I'm sure, is you move your head a little to the left or a little to the right, you raise your camera a little or lower it. Everything's shifting around in the windows here and is shifting around the reflection. So I kind of moved around a little bit, you know, tried a few different uh, positions, probably took six or eight images, which is typical for me to take a, a small number. And what really caught my eye here was the two sort of clashing diagonals. Um, so the windows themselves have these interesting blue frames, kind of bluish silvery blue. They were probably reflecting. It was a very, it was a gray day, as I recall, but they came out kind of bluish, you know, but interesting. And you could see how that creates the rectangles for the reflections. But then because they weren't totally flat, I think they give these sort of funhouse mirror effects. And what they're reflecting is an apartment building uh, behind, you know, behind me, you know, is taking the photograph and filled with, as you can see, Venetian blinds, some are up, most are down. There's some rusty air conditioners. There's these interesting dark brown panels that kind of create these other diagonals going in the other direction. There's little bits of yellows and greens and blues. And it was just fascinating. So I decided I would do some work with it um, on this particular one. And it was fun to do. Uh, so I, I, this, I think of this as living in Allentown, you know, maybe particularly during, you know, the kind of times we're in at, at this point, um, what it might be like. Uh, again, looking at reflections, uh, this is, I believe, a bank uh, building that's one of the newer buildings with lots of glass reflecting some uh, foliage that was outside. You know, uh, it interested me uh, just because as you move around, you see the different reflections. And I must have been in a, quote, reflective mood that day because that's what I was taking pictures of uh, getting some of these. So that that was a, another look at some of a different type of window architecture and the reflections that uh, provide some depth in the image. Another building up there, I think this this may be the county courthouse, perhaps. Um, what fascinated me about this particular building to start with was on the right hand side are these rectangular sections. And I couldn't figure out why some of the windows are windows and some of them are not like i almost get the feeling that can they just like replace the panels and like you know if somebody's not behaving they take away their window and give it to the person in the next office or cubicle i'm not sure i like why are they arranged the way they are a pleasing pattern for the architect that would be interesting to find out and then there was just juxtaposition for um where you can see sort of I'm thinking that the the red portion there has containing some pipes and things that are going up and down and this is a like a, a you know stairway kind of an area off off to the side uh I confess to turning the uh the shade of whatever that red was was not quite as red but I really like the red against the blue so in this case I modified the color in this image uh to get that kind of effect but it's kind of a different you know, putting the red against the edge of the frame, I thought was an interesting compositional piece against some of the, the gray on the right that, you know, is more minimalist. Another building that's one of those modern buildings in Allentown, um, you know, you, you see them just about anywhere and everywhere. And in this particular case, the that day, the sky was this interesting cotton candy puffy things. And so I thought the juxtaposition of the sky actually made a difference in uh, 
getting something going with the building. And then the building in this image, I was all about the the uh, you know, the rectangles and the triangles. You know, it's all about the rectangles and the triangles in the composition here. So that was uh, fun to do. And this is an historic hotel that goes back to the early 1900s. And what interested me here, I'll just zoom in. You can see, hopefully, uh, there's lots of detail on these faces and, you know, the wonderful, intricate work that was done, I guess, in stone here, you know, along with the color of the brick, which reminds me of some brick that I've seen in southern, southeastern Ohio. So interesting architecture and uh, a different take on one of the older buildings, uh, as well as some of the newer buildings, which is such a mix there in Allentown. So I have a few images from the Navy Yard. Uh, so in this case, um, what I discovered in being there several times is that it's not just a Navy Yard, it's got all the new stuff that have been built for businesses. <clears throat> so some of you may have been down there to photograph, you may be aware of this, you may even live there as there is apartments there. Uh, there's a hotel um, and at the moment, the USS New Jersey is being retrofitted there. You probably read about this in the newspaper. And if everything goes well, we'll be back parked at its birth on the New Jersey side uh, for the 4th of July. So let's hope that that's what happens. What I was surprised to find down here, uh, and this isn't necessarily a small take, is um, a bocce ball court. <laughs> so there's actually a residential park with some paths and benches you can sit on and a bocce ball court that looks like it gets used once in a while. And I was surprised to discover that there was this uh, residential aspect to the Navy Yard. So here I was able to get some, uh, you know, not just uh, the kind of abstracts you've seen in some of these smaller takes where I'm abstracting, but you kind of still know it's architecture, where here you may not be quite sure what this is. And uh, the reason I took the image was that there's, uh, there's some kind of, as I recall, there was a reflections going on here with uh, windows. And I just was fascinated how the right-hand side of this, as I put a frame around it, uh, was so calm, these calm sort of pinstripes. And then there's all these curvy lines. And then on the left, it made me think of radio signals from like an old 1940s or 50s you know, film you know, where if only we could understand the message coming through those radio waves as they crackle up the antennas. So that I thought was really kind of made for a different juxtaposition. So I decided I would make more of an abstracted abstract for this particular image. And the times when I photographed down there, which is several times, it's always been a nice day. <laughs> so there's lots of reflected blue sky uh, in the times that I've been down there. This is a little bit less abstract. Uh, what caught my eye here was the railings and the reflection of the railings. Um, I really liked how the railings are sort of, there's a bit of a nautical theme. I mean, it's the Navy Yard, so they have kind of that bit of a, as if you're on the edge of a deck of a ship, perhaps, or something, and you grab a hold of those railings and swing down into something. But the way they were reflected because of the structure of the building and its wavy glass just kind of gives it a, almost a flag waving of appearance on the right hand side. And I kind of like that. It's not the greatest photo in the world, but an interesting photo. All nonetheless, I kind of like the uh, the colors and the, and the angles. I also do some intentional camera movement at times, mostly because it's fun. So I don't know if any of you have done intentional camera movement or all of you. Um, in this case, I usually set my, uh, you know, either I lower my ISO if I can, depending on how dark it is, or I'll use a filter to get a shutter speed of somewhere around a quarter of a second, maybe, you know, eighth of a second, uh, half a second, somewhere in that range. Uh, and then I move my camera. And because we can look at the backs of our cameras if we choose to nowadays, um, you can, I'll take a picture and then I'll move my camera in another way or another way, and as I'll try to narrow in on a composition, you know, so I feel like I'm sort of working toward it, because when you first do the ICM, you, it, there's always a bit of a surprise, and I kind of like, um, you know, with many of the images you've seen here, uh, there's a certain uh, graphic design quality where things are very carefully lined up and aligned, whereas with an ICM photo, there's you can't be quite as careful, and you have to 
uh, allow for a little element, a little more element of luck, a bit as if you were doing street photography. So I like the lines and the colors and the way the ICM came out. And so that's why I was including this image. And uh, this particular image uh, I titled Under Surveillance because that's how it looks and feels. And I, uh, if you've been following the stories, if you read the Philadelphia Inquirer, there's been some discussion about uh, surveillance cameras that have been added in Philadelphia and people using them in ways they hadn't intended. But in this case, one of the things I like to do when I'm photographing uh, buildings or even signposts is I bring my camera really, really close to the building. So in this case, I'm standing directly under that surveillance camera. My camera is about six inches away from the building, almost touching. It's a wide angle. And so uh, you get these really cool pyramid shapes, which I like. And then by arranging your position around the corner of a building, in this case, it was at the corner, um, I can decide how much of each side to share or show. What I liked about it was the corporate feel of the smooth, slick glass and that surveillance camera that sort of has the impression of saying, you don't ask the questions, we ask the questions. It has that sort of sinisterish sort of quality to me, but it's also a lovely, you know, a little bit of a monolith. And uh, that's another reason why I took that, took that particular image. There's also old uh, buildings there. It's the Navy Yard. So uh, it retains things like the residence of the Naval Commander and then some administration buildings where there were, you know, administrative things going on. This is a detail of one of those. Uh, in this case, um, what I really loved was this incredible brickwork. Um, you can see there's a lot of incredible detail. These little round bits here, almost like rivets and uh, the detail that went in along this stonework here, just gorgeous, just gorgeous things. Um, cool windows, great color. Uh, I decided to go with, you know, this was obviously, this was sort of cropped down to like a 16 by nine, uh, sort of a cinematic uh, kind of a format, but uh, it was of course originally shot a little larger um, because I knew I wanted to kind of get into this, you know, nice little uh, symmetrical take on this gorgeous old building. So now we're going to go uh, to look at a couple of places here that are uh, by one of the architectural geniuses, Frank Geary. And in researching uh, the Lewis Science Library, uh, which I photographed on the Princeton University campus, I came across what someone had uh, preserved, which is this original sketch. So this is Frank Geary's kind of back of the envelope. Can you just picture him like at dinner with the people who are, you know, interviewing the architects? And he's, he says, wait a minute, I have a great idea. And he pulls out his, his pen and he pulls out his, just grabs some paper from someone. And then he starts scribbling and talking and whatever he said, he got the, he got it. Uh, you know, of course he has by this point uh, quite a reputation. Uh, but it's really cool to see that that's what the sketch was. And then you'll see what the actual building looks like. Uh, in this particular building, he got the commission around 2003. It took about five years to complete it. And um, he used a lot of stainless steel and glass. He used a lot of brick because he wanted to kind of have it retain. He, he was very aware of what are the buildings around it because it's on the Princeton University campus and there's plenty of old buildings that have been there for a very long time. So he wanted to pay homage to this space around it. So he's an architect who's thinking not just about his own building, but about how it fits in the environment that it's going into. Very cool stuff. Um, I was really enjoyed this quote. I'm just gonna read this quote of his that was uh, I thought was so wonderful. He, he says, sometimes we are inspired by everyday objects that have beautiful shapes. Sometimes we are inspired by the energy and life of the cities in which we work. I love that just because I love the energy of of a city, you know, and the life around it and all those things. And I do get inspired by everyday objects. You know, you just come across something, you know, the way the light's falling across the, your kitchen table and you're like, whoa, I have to take a photograph of that. So I kind of like that and, you know, uh, really enjoyed uh, the way he put that in words. And the last thing I'll just note here at the bottom of, uh, it talks about how they didn't have traditional architectural plans for this building. Instead, uh, they created a computerized uh, three-dimensional model. 
And then whenever they wanted to do anything, they would just kind of extrapolate out what how big something was supposed to be because the computerized model would tell you. I thought that was kind of cool and different than what we normally see as an architectural plan. So here is the building from the outside, kind of a look at the whole building. And uh, in this case, I'm going to just blow my own horn for a moment here. Uh, this particular image, uh, I decided I would submit to the Architecture Master Prize Photography Competition. So they have a competition for architects for the masters, you know, about their buildings, but there's also a competition for photographs. And they have it very fine grain categories. And this particular one is educational exteriors is the category. And this was a winner in the educational exterior category last year. And I was like, oh, so excited because it was kind of fun to create the image and then send it in. And here you can see his use of steel and brick and glass in all different ways. So in going to photograph it, to me, it felt like these are the faces of Lewis Science Library, and there's different faces depending on who the Lewis Science Library is talking to or how you're looking at it or where you're looking at it. So on one side, you'll see this metal and it reflects things. It's reflecting the brick. It's reflecting the sky. It's got this cool kind of conical shape, this almost shell-like shape. Uh, you know, how he even forms the metal to do this, I have no idea, but very exciting to see. You know, I, I spent... Um, I must have spent 20 minutes just looking at this, looking and looking, and then finally, you know, took a few photos, you know, after watch, watching it for a little bit. Very cool space. But then you walk around to another portion of the building, and it's like, I felt like it was space age, and the, the sky was incredibly cooperative on this particular day. And to me, it had the feeling of, I'm looking at something that it was built for the year 20, 2100 which I'll never see, but it has that space age quality to it, as we would call it, since we grew up in the space age, many of us. And uh, I thought, wow, this is the same building, the same person designed this that designed that other portion. That was so interesting. And then I went around to a section that had the brick and it was as if I had fallen into like a Southwest Canyon of Southwest United States. You have this red brick, almost adobe colored in some ways. Um, and it's kind of interesting, almost slot canyon like where you're going up a very narrow uh, little V that it comes to at this portion of the building. Very cool. I just thought that was really interesting. You could have so many different takes on the same building. Uh, and someday I'd like to go inside. Uh, I don't know if you have to be a student, uh, but maybe there's a way for a photographer to get in because it's supposed to be a gorgeous uh, library inside as well. This photo is not of the Lewis Science Library, but of uh, some of the buildings in the music dance complex area near the Wallace Dance Building. I just love the curve of the building and the reflection of the curve that has the illusion of like, wait a minute, it's, is that the building? Is that the reflection of the building? And so I like that you're not quite sure if you're looking through the glass at something or a reflection of it. In this case, I think think we're looking through the glass and it's not reflecting another building, but I'm not sure. I've forgotten. So <laughs> I'll have to go back and take a look, but I like the, um, the illusion of it. Not quite sure what's happening. I included this image, which actually has a person be just because it was one of my favorite images from last year. So uh, this is the Wallace Dance Building. There's a little walkway. And as people would walk across this walkway with the late afternoon sunlight coming in, as they walked left to right, their shadow would race right to left down that, that wall. I wish I had a video of it because it was mesmerizing. So I got a couple photos of this person, a couple photos of one more person, and that was it. No one else crossed the bridge for about 15 minutes and I had to move on. But I decided I was going to get a picture of it because I love the shape of the shadows and the light and everything. It was a very cool space. So I'll have to go back for some more people walking by on a busier day. And we're going to go back out to Los Angeles for the last uh, the last uh, large building here. This is the Walt Disney Concert Hall and also a Frank Gehry image uh, or a Frank Gehry um, design and uh, building. Another sketch. So he's good at doing his sketches. And the fact that people preserve them shows, you know, his reputation that if he's sketching something, you want to hold on to it. And I found a a couple of uh, stock photos here. These are not my photos. Uh, the future site of the Walt Disney Concert Hall. I think these are, I'm pretty sure that these are houses kind of getting ready to be rolled off. 
I'm guessing there was a whole bunch of them here and they just destroyed the entire neighborhood for this empty lot and rolled the buildings away. So I was just kind of fascinated about the history of whatever that was. And then on that site, uh, you know, uh, some 40 years later was the Walt Disney Concert Hall with all those soaring curves to it. He originally uh, got this in 1987, at which time he was thinking about stone. But then he built uh, his first building with the cool metal curves that he's known for in Balbeo, Spain. Maybe some of you have traveled there to see it. I would love to go see it someday. I've not been there. Um, and he took the knowledge he learned from how to build that, and he brought it here to the Walt Disney Concert Hall. So you'll see, you know, there's curves everywhere, um, ordinary staircases, but cool railings. There's the same sort of glass and curves here that you saw in the Lewis Science Library, because he fit, this was finished in 2003, the same year that he got the award for the Lewis Science Library. So at that point, he now knew how to work with the metal and do those type of things, which is um, probably why he's included that in the Lewis Science Library. And you can see there's some of these large, you know, large pieces around the glass kind of giving that sense. So here I'm going in for my small takes. Uh, I was fascinated by the sharp, sharp point of this portion of the building. It reminded me of the National Gallery down in Washington, which is designed by the architect I.M. Pei. If you've ever been to Washington to the National Gallery, Gallery, you'll know that the glass walls have it come to a point. And it's kind of cool how the architects can create this point that really resonates. Uh, it catches your eye. It creates a focal point, um, And it looked really great against the background uh, that was there. This is Los Angeles. It was sunny and it was blue sky uh, as usual there. This was uh, another sort of an exercise of taking a look at a wall and looking a little bit at the sky and trying to put together a composition with trapezoids and triangles and different portions of uh, the building and all of the different colors that were present because uh, he does use a lighter and a darker color and he actually uses some that because it, parts might reflect the sky, they might look a little more blue. It's a little nautical in that sense, like the sea has its uh, different colors. This is that same area, but in this uh, at this time, there was a shadow uh, cast by another portion of the structure. And I really, really like the shadow. Uh, and uh, this particular one, um, like the sharp-nosed one, were another couple of uh, images that received awards last year in architecture uh, exhibitions. So it was fun to, to see this one. Uh, I think there's something about seeing the shadow against the curve that makes it a little different. And there's the mix of everything. <laughs> so he's got the steel frames, the glass. There's a little reflection that creates some rainbow. I did not put that in. It was there from the, from the light. Um, I loved all the shapes and the curves and the lines, and it just made for a kind of a very close-up section of a portion of that front part of the gallery. And let's, this last image, uh, it, it does look like the prow of a ship. It looks like something that should be in the Navy Yard, and it's sort of that uh, sharp pointed portion and another part in the back. And I know we had a theme of sails here, and so maybe they were intended to be sails, but I real, really felt like I was looking at the prow of a ship when I stood right directly in front of it from that particular angle. So it made for, um, again, the drama being created by the genius architect, but it was fun to try to find a, put a frame around a little portion of it. So I just want to end by saying that um, as luck would have it, if you will, timing wise, uh, myself and my good friend Dutch Bagley have an exhibition at Gallery 14, which is over in Hopewell, New Jersey. So if you happen to be in the Princeton area, this is maybe 20 minutes from Princeton, uh, uh, just kind of over into New Jersey. Um, I have about 20 prints uh, of the work you just saw uh, uh, tonight, about 20. Not all of these were in there, but uh, about 20 of them, uh, and the prints are on the wall. So if you're interested in seeing how they look as a print, you could stop by. And Dutch has a very interesting group of types of photography he's not normally known for. When he presented here, uh, you saw what he's known for mostly is those incredible black and white photographs uh, with drama. 
But in this case, he also photographs everything from rust on the wall to uh, beautiful nature shots, uh, areas in the Adirondacks. And so you'll have a chance to see both. So if you get a chance uh, in any of the first three weekends in June, we're off on Memorial Day weekend. But if you happen to be over there on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon, uh, stop by. Dutch and I will be there on June 9th and we'll do a little artist talk about our work as well. So at that, I'm going to stop my sharing, Adam, if that's okay. And I'll come back here and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any or any comments. Thank you for listening. First of all, I'm gonna thank you. So um, I needed I needed something nice and enjoyable and you provided. So thank you. Yay. Thank you. Yay. Thank Yay. you. Thank you. I'm glad thank I leaned. It was real, it was really good. Hope it did brighten your day. And and once again, I mean, it just gives us a feeling for what we, we write with light, we capture it, but we basically have to understand it before we capture it. And your images were just amazing. So thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And now somebody else better talk. Yeah, John. Yes. Uh, thank, you. Thank you for sharing those images. Uh, I really enjoyed seeing many of them, and you have given me an idea about to travel some to some places that I haven't been. So that's a great, uh, you know, and great tribute to your subjects. So thank you. Uh, question about lenses: What lens or lenses do you find that you're using most and how, you know, how um, far from your subject, you know, are you when you're photographing some of these subjects? Yeah, I have, I have two lenses I use the most often. So one is a, a 70 to 200 uh, F4. I'm a, I'm a Canon uh, equipment, so it's a Canon lens. And so it's, it's very sharp. It's got image stabilization. What I like is that I can um, zoom in enough, you know, to you know, capture something and get a frame around it without having to crop in a whole lot or something. I try to get it as close as I can in camera. And um, and that works well for uh, particularly any kind of details that are farther up on a building and allows me to isolate a portion of a building. And then I also uh, usually bring along what I call my walk around lens. It's a 24 to 105. So I can shoot those wide angle images with the 24 millimeter and I can zoom in enough, you know, at 100 millimeter to uh, get close enough. Those are the two that I use the most often. And then when I'm not shooting just the small takes, but doing a whole space, I will use like that 15 millimeter extra wide because you can just get such cool stuff with it that you can't otherwise. But for the details, I, I most often using the 7200. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated by the way you see things that typically most of us would just walk past, right? I think you have a a fascinating way in which you, your eye is, sees some things. I don't know if you trained it, what obviously over time, but but the intimacy with which you, the intimate aspects of architecture that you capture is quite fascinating. I just, uh, they're very, very different. Yeah. You know, every photographer has that, you know, <laughs> in our own way, whatever our subjects, you know, but thank you. Yeah, but, but I think every, you know, a lot of us photographers, we capture stuff, but you've sort of developed your own style and you your own sort of niche. And, and I think if I see an image of, if I see one of your images, I'll know it's your image because you have a very unique perspective on how you look at things. Just a quick question, the the, the people crossing the bridge in the shadow, where was that? I missed that. That's, uh, it's called the Wallace Dance Building on the Princeton University. Oh, it's at Princeton, okay. okay. So uh, one side of the building, I think, uh, I'm pretty sure houses a performance area as well as classrooms and the other one is more classrooms. And so- I guess the students are back and forth all day as they play and do their things and so. Yeah, Princeton's very rich with uh, images. I was just there for an hour for a talk and we did a walk around and I got to get back over there one of these days. But um, you you probably may also enjoy if you already haven't been to the temple in New Jersey, the new temple that was built 
Oh, I have to go. Yes, I've oh, seen people's I photographs of it. Just go crazy <laughs> over there. It is so rich and so ripe with opportunity. Yes, but, it's. But, uh, oh, thanks for this great presentation. Like, thank you. Yeah, that's like a med meditation uh, temple, if you will. I've forgotten whose it is. The one you're talking about. Yeah, if you. Yeah, know. it's it's a Hindu temple, but the the sculpture, the marble work, it's just insane. Hmm. Great. I will get over there. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hi, my name's Art. Hi, Art. Your work is incredibly beautiful and wonderful. Great eye for these wonderful scaling triangles and weird little shapes and textures and details and perspectives. And uh, they all come together very beautifully. I just found this photograph by Walker Evans. I don't think it's going to come out, though, is it? Will it come out? Uh, not, not quite really focusing out. on you instead, but I, I see the cross. Yes, that's the Walker Evans photograph. Yes, that's the one. It's a okay, little okay. It says Walker Evans, the graveyard and steel mill in Bethlehem, PA, November 1935. Yep, uh, wonderful, joyful photographs. You're you you were enjoying yourself taking them, and we're enjoying ourselves looking at them. Great, that's 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 a good thing. <laughs> All good, yes, yes. Thanks, and Art, I do enjoy. Uh, I follow you on Instagram, and I enjoy seeing your work there. So, oh yeah. my God, talk really? about talk about you. quirky. You have a lot of interesting uh, subjects that are like, wow, you found a photograph there. <laughs> so. Uh, kudos to you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get a kick out of this. I'm also in the witty column, the flicker site, too. Nice. I'd put your Instagram uh, tag in the chat and we'll take a look at it. Thank you. A, uh, it must be art.breatman or at art.breatman or something like that. B R A I T M A N. Whatever. Well, I certainly had a wonderful time, Eileen. It was a lot of fun to present, and I enjoyed sharing my work tonight. So thank you for oh, the thank, opportunity. Thank, thank you so much. I, I just really think that if you if you just give um, one hour once a month, you, you have to be inspired. You, you have to see something. Um, you, 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 have, you have to be inspired. You, you, if you're, if, yeah, it, inspired to take pictures inspired to look at things differently um just just in, just or, or just thrilled that you've been able to see uh photographs that you had didn't even think about being yeah you know, I, I i'm sorry I, i'm just very wordy but um i i love the zoom presentations um uh, once a month uh one hour once a month um it's photography. It's photography. It's photography. It's photography. And thank you so much for attending tonight. Thank you for your presentation. And let's look forward to um, June 18th. Thank you, Adam.